Um, yes, it's working. It's working, okay. Excellent, thanks everyone for coming. So we uh, tonight, we're super happy to have uh, Oleg. So Oleg, I hope I can pronounce your name properly, say that, Jeff. The I hope it's correct. Yes, that's yes. good. Okay, and so, so uh, Oleg is from Oracle, Oracle Labs. He's a developer advocate, uh, working on Graal VM and the Java champion. And uh, yes, yeah, so tonight will be a Graal VM night. So first we will dig, dig into uh, more of uh, an introduction for Java developers for Graal VM. Like uh, it's really good for you if you haven't used Graal VM yet and if you want to get some general knowledge about it. And uh, you, get, you have the best person for that because Oleg is really specialized on, on this topic. And we have Adrian Norton from Zenica, who is the CTO of Zenica Singapore. And uh, so he'll be actually taking a very interesting uh, perspective. Uh, we basically will see that Graal VM is good for your performance, is good for your memory footprints. Can we try to apply this and say that it could be good for the environment, that you're going to use less resources? So it basically means that you would save money and also have less footprint on the environment by using GraalVM. Would it make sense or not? That's the thing that Adrian is going to discuss. So thanks everyone for joining. And uh, yeah, Oleg, yeah, you can start. Thank you very much for the introductions. Uh, I think it will be a very interesting uh, mix of two sessions. Uh, I hope can you see my screen? Yes. Very good. Very good. So I hope I hope we'll we'll set up the stage with some introduction about GraalVM. And it's a very interesting project. It's a very versatile runtime. So it's GraalVM is a, a high performance virtual machine for different languages, uh, and gives you several very unique capabilities. Uh, and since there are different languages, right? Of course, GraalVM can be used for, uh, for for those. So you can use GraalVM even if you're not strictly speaking a Java developer or not using a JVM language, right? So if you are uh, like a Node, you should write Node.js apps, or if you're doing some Python, uh, maybe GraalVM can help you as well. So in this session, in this first part, I'll try to concentrate on specifically what GraalVM can do for Java applications and using Java here loosely. So whenever I say Java, uh, don't get discouraged if you're using some other JVM language, right? It's all, if it goes to the JVM bytecode, GraalVM, like we will call it Java here, right? So <laughs> a little bit fast and loose with terminology, but it will save us time. My name is Alex Shalaev and as a, uh, yeah, yeah, I work at the Oracle Labs on the GraalVM team. And Oracle Labs is a research and development facility department within Oracle, right? So the goal of Oracle Labs is to actually do science, right? So people, people do science, people set up the experiments, people figure out new ways to do things, and then they publish academic papers about that. And then eventually that accumulated knowledge we try to convert that into the products, into the industrial uh, know-how that uh, the community at large can also use and leverage. If you have any questions, but you don't have time today, then you can find me online. I go by at Shalaev almost universally. And let's, let's just go further. Uh, this is a technical presentation, so do not make any foregoing business decisions based on the contents of this. Uh, we talk technology here. Uh, so with that out of the way, GraalVM, as I said, there are, it's a high performance polyglot embeddable virtual machine. So there are three main uh, qualities there. One is high performance, very self-explanatory, right? GraalVM strives to be the fastest runtime for programs in particular languages. Uh, of course, best in class. Uh, and of course, it's not very comparable between language to language very much but like Graal Python tries to be the fastest Python, right? So our uh, ways to run Java code try to be the fastest and the most efficient Java code runtime and so on for all the other languages as well. So high performance is easy. Polyglot is also, it's very confusing for people, but also kind of easy because polyglot just means that you can build systems where different 
components uh, consist of like different languages. So you can have like say a, a machine learning piece that is implemented in Python and it would sit in within the same process as your Java application, just leveraging that uh, one particular component. And the third part is the embeddability. The Gradient project was created from scratch in a way that it's easier to put into your Java and native applications, right? So you can, you can take this technology and for example, if you have a large native application, like maybe a database, some companies create databases, you can put GraalVM into that and enhance your native applications with capability to run, for example, JavaScript, right? Which could be a very interesting solution. Right, so this is what GraalVM is in a nutshell. There are very many parts. So for Java developers, there are three main benefits that you can get from using GraalVM that I want you to know about. First, there is a just-in-time compiler that is absolutely state-of-the-art, right? It's written in Java, so it's a little bit easier to reason about for Java developers, right? And since it uses a high-level language, it's a little bit easier to maintain and evolve than maybe some other choices. So it's a state of the art. It's, it's really, really good. It produces really good machine code. Uh, it has a number of very good high level optimizations uh, that give uh, GraalVM its performance boost. So this is one, the most straightforward application of GraalVM. Just use it as your Java runtime with the best just-in-time compiler getting your applications faster. The second part is, probably the most hyped part of GraalVM is the ahead of time compilation technology called native image. What it can do, it can take your application, uh, your JVM bytecode and compile that ahead of time into the native platform binary. So what that means is that that result doesn't depend on the JVM. So it's a standalone application. And then it has the performance profile of the native binary. So it will start fast because everything is pre-compiled. It will use less memory because it doesn't need to compile anything uh, and it will run with decent performance. So that is very interesting for several use cases that are very popular lately in the Java ecosystem. So we're gonna talk about that quite a bit in this session. And the third value is the multilingual virtual machine. So you can take your Java application and teach it to run JavaScript and not not in a, not in a like, uh, I don't want to say substandard, not in a like custom ad hoc way. Our JavaScript is standard compliant, right? We implement ECMAScript 2020, which is the more, the most like recent JavaScript version. So you can take your JavaScript code that you, for example, run in your node application or in your browser, and you can put it in your Java application and it will run there. Or as I mentioned, you can write a component in Python and connect it with your Java application without creating like a fleet of small microservices that you would otherwise have to do. You don't have to mix all the languages. This is what like very, very often people, people uh, immediately get scared that, oh, there's, since it's a polyglot machine, they have to start learning Ruby and R because inevitably their application will be full with with some R code, just because it's possible to do. <laughs> of course not. You have to you have to know that there is a use case for this, and then GraalVM can offer you a solution. Uh, but you don't have to actually make your applications more complex than necessary if you don't want to. So we're going to talk mostly about the first two, and a little bit about the third. Unless you have uh, later questions, and then I can uh, elaborate on, on on some use cases and some particular uh, projects that tried this and uh, have been talking about the usages. Right. So let's start with the compiler. Uh, let's start with a quick reference first. So I just recently published an article on our core, uh, team blog uh, on Medium, medium.com/slash/gralvm, and it's a quick reference. So everything that GraalVM can do largely, the largest capabilities are outlined there. So you can just go find GraalVM quick reference, uh, download that, it's a, it's a PDF, you can print it out if you want, uh, if, you're still, if you're still doing that 
without any regard for the sustainability of such solutions. Uh, but you can also just read the article and just you will get a very good grasp of what Gravium can do. So that was just a little bit of information. So Java applications, we can take Java application and on Gravium, we can run them in two different ways. Right? We can run them with the JIT, and that would be normally how you normally run your applications. So the context of that will be the open JDK environment. Right? So Gravium includes a compatible JDK, and we currently distribute to Java 8 and Java 11 based versions. I think this is a good, the good idea currently. If there is a chat capability here somewhere in Zoom that you can, uh, you can, you can use, can you please type what versions of Java you are currently using in production the most? So just numbers, and I will look at that later. Uh, it just for me to to get a little bit of glimpse uh, what we're dealing with. Right, so we have eight and 11 and you can download that. You can run Java. It will run within the context of OpenJDK normally, just the JIT will be replaced with the Gravium JIT and your application can potentially go faster uh, when it's done. And then there is this ahead of time compilation mode, which involves a little bit more involved life cycle, right? So you build the native image first by using the native image utility and you feed your bytecode there. You feed your classes and your jar files there. That's this one part, the build part. And then you actually run that application and that is a native application. So you run it by just, well, running the double clicking on it. Uh, and that is the other way to run applications, Java applications on Gravium. Those two are complementary. You don't have to, you don't have to necessarily say like, I want this or I want JIT or I want AOT. Gravium gives you a choice so you can pick whichever better fits your needs and your say performance profile that you desire. Let's look at that, right? So and the, ben the benefits of uh, both, how it's run. So you run on the Java hotspot VM, right? Because we are in the context of the open JDK. So hotspot is the implementation for the JVM. The Gravium JIT compiler plugs into it using JVM CI, which is the Java virtual machine compiler interface, which is a special interface, right? It's an, it's, a, it's an interface that was added to Java 9. Uh, I think it was JEP 243, which is how you plug third-party compilers to Hotspot. So Gravium JIT integrates using that, uh, well, default, like out-of-the-box interface that is provided there by OpenJDK, right? And through those two layers, we can run Java applications normally, right? The, the VM will do whatever the VM needs to do. Right? It will find classes, it will load classes, it will, it will uh, run with the garbage collection that OpenJDK provides, right? all that. That is the Java applications. The other layers for other languages, we need additional uh, machinery there. So that is the Truffle framework and the Truffle runtimes, uh, what, it, what is there. Right? So Truffle offers you the DSL, the framework API to create interpreters for the languages. And by building an interpreter, you get the full capability of, of, of the high-performance virtual machine. So the Truffle framework will uh, enable that interpreter to be efficiently compiled together with the program at runtime. So it will run fast as well. So to enable support for those other languages, we just need to create Java applications, which are the interpreters using a special framework uh, but those are normal Java programs on top of uh, GraalVM. And we have a bunch of languages there. Some of them are community uh, uh, implementations. Some of them are actually like third party private languages that people just use. And then yes, there is the LLVM Bitcode uh, interpreter which can run native code. So GraalVM can run Doom for example, which is not a very, which is not a very fascinating fact because everything can run Doom, including the modern microwaves and watches and everything. But Gravium is also within the, the, the number of things that can run Doom, right? So this is, this is what runs when you run the, with the JIT. And the, first, the point is that we want our application. Why do we integrate the third-party compiler into the OpenJDK? Isn't the OpenJDK good enough? So what we want to have, we want to have a compiler that is actually sophisticated enough that it can run code that is hard 
that is abstract, that like that it's easy for people to reason about, right? The code that you want to write, but it's maybe harder for the compiler to reason about and optimize. So Chris Newland here, who is a, definitely a performance expert, uh, the, uh, he, an author of some performance range books. And he says that for his team, for code that is critical, no functional or advanced object orientation features can be used, right? You have to write dump code so your runtime will understand it and optimize it efficiently, right? So that of course makes us sad because as the, as the team that does virtual machines, we think that the virtual machine should be smart enough that you can use abstractions that you want, right? Without getting, getting uh, to the lower levels, right? So, and we sort of achieved that, I think. So if you want to get started with GraalVM, this is what you do. You download, you unpack it, and you are ready to go. You put it on the path. You have your Java there. It will be GraalVM. And then you can run all sorts of benchmarks and all sorts of uh, workloads. One benchmark suit that I, I would recommend is the Renaissance, which is the suite of benchmarks, which is actually, can, it consists of the benchmarks of other projects that were specifically picked to have some interesting part about the workload. Some of them are memory intensive, some of them are CPU intensive, some of them are with like parallelizing execution, some of them with parallel memory accesses. So there was a, a very interesting academic paper about the Renaissance benchmark suite uh, and how those benchmarks were picked. Uh, but you can see there, just if you just look at the names there, there is some Akka, there is some Dotti, which is Scala. Uh, there is some, some mass, the like Gauss and uh, progressions. There are some naive bias, which is a probability theory. There are some Neo4j analytics. Neo4j is, of course, a dig graph database uh, that is a very memory intensive workload. Uh, there are some this, the reactor and Rx Scrabble, so it's some reactive extensions in play, right? The libraries that you use in your code are represented in there. Uh, and Wallavium achieves a really, really good results on those. Uh, almost universally being faster than uh, OpenJDK of the same version. Uh, but that is not particularly the point. Uh, GraalVM is faster, usually is faster, right? And, but the point is we also run a ton of benchmarks uh, that we know it. Now for you to know it, that's a different question, right? The best way for you to know it is to actually run it on your code. Right, so you, you, the getting started is very simple. You just need to unpack it and run it and try it on your code and see whether this is fast or not. Because however, like the more, if we run just benchmarks and not the real life code, right? Then we get into this, you know, this point where we optimize for those particular benchmarks and it becomes a game. It's like overfitting the machine learning algorithm. We show really good numbers on that benchmark, but when we see the real world code, the performance is not up to the expectations. So that's why I like Renaissance particularly because uh, it uses frameworks and libraries that we are currently using, that are currently being developed, right? This is not the benchmark suite that was created 15 years ago when we wrote Java very differently, right? So, but again, right? You should, you should, you should think about benchmarks. You should try on your code and you should uh, extrapolate with care. Uh, one, one thing that, definitely speaks for GraalVM is that, for example, it, it improves very rapidly. So the last year, right? So 19.3 was released in, well, 2019 and 20.3 was released a year later in 2020. And over a large range of benchmarks, Decapo, SpecJVM, Renaissance, and Scala Decapo, the newer versions of GraalVM got approximately 6% faster than the older ones. And that is not just faster because the old benchmark like baseline was lousy, right? It's very, it's very easy to show relative improvement when you start from the low point, <laughs> right? But when you start from the, the best of the best and then you add 6% of improvement, that says a lot, right? And uh, the progress there is not stopping, right? So, so definitely this is something. If, if you would like to have a faster runtime for your Java applications, you, this is something that you want to look at, right? Uh, so this concludes sort of part about the JIT, the introduction about the JIT, uh, because it's sort of simple and very transparent for 
uh, the user. You download, you unpack, you run it, it's faster. If it's not faster, submit an issue, we will make it faster or we will try to make it faster, right? Uh, and so it's very simple to, to understand and use, right? AUT is a little bit more involved and it starts from the understanding of what we mean when we talk about performance. What does it mean to have better performance specifically in the context of the ahead of time compiled application? So apparently when people talk about performance, what means my application is faster or my language or my runtime is faster, they mean different things. Sometimes they mean the peak throughput and the uh, the bestest latencies that we can have, right? This is what we normally optimize for when we run our Java applications. This is what, uh, what JVMs, Java Virtual Machines, have optimized for 25 years now, right? We run our application, it runs four hours, it warms up, and then it's really, really fast, and then we measure it. That is the peak throughput, right? Uh, of the max latency is we run our workload and the slowest responses are the maximum latency. So the faster are the slowest responses, the better is the general user experience because there are no requests which are stalling because of the latency. And there are the different factors, right? There is a, the quality of the JIT code, uh, JITed code, sorry, the quality of the GC and the runtime in general, but that is a different dimension of performance. Right? And sometimes you want not to have latencies at all, right? So if then you would probably go with like pauseless, pauseless garbage collection, and then you don't maybe care about the throughput that much. So you don't care how many users you serve using the particular set of hardware. But then there are also other dimensions. Sometimes people say fast when they mean that the application is starting fast and it's ready to go as soon as possible, right? That there is no long startup and warm up phase and they say, this is what I mean performance, right? Sometimes people say, I want to put as many applications, I want to scale my application in a constrained environment, and I want to assign the smaller chunks of memory to every particular application, because this way I can utilize my hardware to the best, because I will, I will have the smaller building blocks, right? The smaller containers. Uh, sometimes people even say like, oh, performance is packaging, right? If your application is too big, then, then it's slow because it will be slow in certain use cases, right? So there are different dimensions. The good thing is that the JIT part, when you run with a JIT, you normally would get good results at the peak throughput and a good latency, right? You will not get the good result on the startup speed because the JIT needs to warm up and actually JIT stuff, right? It actually has to do work at runtime so it cannot be fast from the very beginning. The same with the memory footprint. The JIT needs to do work for that. It needs to allocate memory for itself to do the graphs of the application that you're running, right? To compile that code, it needs to use memory for itself. So the memory usage will be always higher. The larger your application is, the more code needs to be compiled, the higher this overhead of the JIT will be. The ahead of time compiled application Typically, they feature different trade-offs there, right? So the startup speed will be better. Everything is pre-compiled. The memory usage will be lower because, so better, because there is no JIT. Nothing needs to be compiled. Your application just needs to do your business logic to run whatever you need to do. The packaging will probably be smaller because you don't need to run the runtime. So you just, you can ship literally your application. So the, those two modes, kind of have those trade-off between what they mean when they say I'm fast. And it's very interesting because, uh, because sorry, uh, the startup speed, memory footprint and packaging are very po popular criteria for performance in the cloud workloads, right? So when we run our software in the cloud, we usually want better startup speed, better memory management, lower footprint, small packaging. Because in the cloud, we don't want to scale our application manually. Something else will scale it. So we never know when we need more instances or less instances. So having like this uh, one Java process that is uh, taken care of is maybe non-ideal for the cloud. 
So this is this is where this is where it's very uh, nice that GraalVM gives you options to run this way or that way. So you can just pick and choose whichever you want. Right. So you like GraalVM doesn't compete with solutions that offer JET because it offers native image, right? Because it offers AOT. Uh, because it competes because it offers a better JIT. <laughs> and the AOT is just a cherry on top. Right. So this is how you run. And this is the second part that you can put. Alternatively, you can run the native image of your application. And that will be the platform binary. How it works is that your bytecode is analyzed under the closed world assumption. This is important, right? This is important because this outlines the trade-off. And you need to be aware of that because otherwise you will start trying to do that and you will get discouraged. And uh, you will come to our channels with questions and I will be sad because I would understand that I failed. <laughs> so this, this is what we need to understand. The closed world assumption means that all the bytecode that will ever be executed is known in advance when we build our application. Right? So there is no random loading of new classes at runtime. Everything is known in the beginning, which is very typically the, actually how we build software. We package them into the immutable Docker containers anyway. There is no additional classes that will just come out of nowhere. So seeing all the bytecodes allows us to have very aggressive optimizations. For example, we can, we can eliminate some null checks if we know that there are items are like objects are non-nulls or if we know the class hierarchy never changes, uh, we can maybe inline some direct method calls easier. Uh, we can bypass the class loader or something at runtime because, uh, because we saw all the bytecode. So we can compile it ahead of time, like not even ahead of time, but like we can compile it before, right? So the, the trade-off there is that dynamic parts require some configuration at runtime, uh, at the build time. And dynamic parts are inherently dynamic, like reflection or generating proxies at runtime. So you need to provide the configuration for that. You don't have to do that manually. There is a Java agent that can provide the configuration for you, but you need to provide the configuration because the static analysis uh, that determines which classes and methods to include in the final application cannot predict your random reflection usages, right? So that is the trade-off. Uh, good performance for AOT versus configuration that needs to be provided at build time. And at the build time, this is what happens, right? All your application, your libraries, the JDK runtime classes, and the components for the runtime uh, from the Gradient project, they all get initialized. They're all written in Java. So it's all Java bytecode. So they all looked, on, looked upon in the same way. So your application is analyzed, your application is initialized, the classes are loaded. Then everything is snapshotted, right? Both the code and the data on the heap. And then it would put in the output executable. Both code and data become parts of that native executable, right? And that native executable includes a runtime component. So this includes a GC, for example, because the application wants to run as if memory is infinite. So it will still run the same way uh, with the GC in the native, uh, in the native binary. So you'll, you will not get the performance of Rust or a performance of hand-tuned C++, uh, but you will get a very different performance profile compared to running Java applications with a JET. And that performance profile is very simple, right? When we look at the startup of application, we will use much less memory. And you can see on the left, this is an example of a, a Micronaut application serving a couple of requests. So on the left, we have the ahead of time compiled application. This is the same application. And on the right, we have the JET. So the left one uses a little bit more than 30 megabytes of memory, right? And it uses just a little bit of CPU only when we serve requests. So the request I served was a one second pause. You can see there are some tiny, tiny splashes of red here on every second when we just serve the request. So in contrast, when we run with JET, the JVM starts and it does a lot of work, right? It needs to do initialization. It needs to do class loading. The memory grows up higher. Then we, the first request hits here at around when the JVM is ready, right? And then 
when the request hits, you start to compile more code and you start to initialize more code. This is just the nature of how the Java process operates. It's, it's not bad, but it's just, it's what it is, right? So it's, it's a, in a striking contrast with the ahead of time compiled way, right? So what the ahead of time compiled mode does, how do you get used of that? It's very simple. You can pick or choose a number of frameworks which support that. There is Helidon, there is Micronaut, there is uh, Quarkus. Uh, Spring works on the Spring native initiative to make Spring applications working with Gravity native image. For common line applications, you can use Pico CLI, which is an excellent library, uh, excellent library for uh, creating common line applications uh, and then compiling them as Gravity native image uh, afterwards. And the best part is that the benefits that come from, from using native image, they by far outweigh the differences between the particular frameworks, right? So the startup speed, for example, with the native image will get to the milliseconds, right? So it will get 20, 40, 70 milliseconds, uh, which is 10x faster than normally, or maybe like 50x faster than normally the application will start. And that is without any uh, regard, without a lot of regard, what application framework you are using, right? So there are some differences there, but then, then again, maybe the difference between 23 milliseconds and 30 milliseconds startup are not particularly that important. The same with the memory footprint. It gets much, much lower than normally uh, with the application of native image. Uh, and the differences between the frameworks become much more negligible. Right. So this is it. This is what the head of time compilation can do for you, right? It can provide you with the, a very nice performance uh, for the cloud deployment specifically. Uh, common line applications are very nicely mapped on the benefits that native image provides, being standalone, being fast at the startup, being low at memory usage. So this is, this is what Gravium can do for Java applications, running with this superb JIT and running as the native executable, right? There are many components to the GraalVM. Some of them are production ready. Some of them are experimental. Uh, so we ways to run Java code are production ready. So both native image and the JIT are production ready. Companies and teams are using that. Uh, people are happy. Uh, everything is good there. Uh, some other languages are experimental. So that means that some things might not work out of the box or require tinkering. Uh, some of some are very new projects like the Python, for example, or uh, there is a language called GRCUDA, which is the, uh, the language to access GPU and NVIDIA GPUs uh, done in collaboration with NVIDIA. Right, if you want to address peak throughput and improve the maximum latency, like those areas where a native image, the ahead of time compile thing wasn't as good as a JET. Uh, there are ways to do that specifically if you use Gravium Enterprise Edition, uh, which is a product by Oracle, you can use the G1 GC uh, garbage collector for improving the latencies. Uh, you can also use profile guide optimizations to capture the profile of your workload and generate better machine code for that. So if you, if you want to do that, I encourage you to use, to look at the actually using Gravium Enterprise Edition and how those things work. Uh, but you don't have to do that. And then Gravium Community Edition will provide you with performance benefits as well, right? So Twitter is using Gravium Compiler in production, running their Scala microservices. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure migrated some, some of their Java workloads. Uh, this was actually, actually this was, uh, quite some time ago now, more than a year ago. And they saw good benefits, less time spent in garbage collection, uh, better performance, the migration without problems, which is very good. Uh, as I mentioned, yes, NVIDIA and the GRQDA language. Uh, it's a very interesting experimental way to maybe access GPU and so on. And of course, if you want support, if you want uh, if you want the absolutely best technology that GraalVM can provide you, you want to look into maybe options how to get Oracle GraalVM Enterprise Edition. Uh, it's functionally the same, so it will run the same programs that 
the open source bits uh, work uh, that Graalvm Community Edition can do, right? But it will provide you with higher performance and some additional optimizations uh, besides the support. So that's that, right? Uh, you can use Graalvm for your application, and I encourage you to look at all the resources that we have, the websites, the team blog, the, the Slack community that we have. And if you try GraalVM, I hope it works for you out of the box uh, as it does for many, many teams and projects. But uh, yeah, come talk to us. If, it's, if it works not as great as you would like it to work, come talk to us, obviously. If it works as great as you expected, come talk to us as well, because that is absolutely the best feedback that the team can get is that people try and use the products and they're happy in that. So that is, that is something we don't have enough in the industry, I feel, uh, just spreading the, the positive message about, not particularly Gravium, but just in general about the, the projects that we use here and there. When something works, it's, normally it's a lot of invisible work has been put into that, right? Uh, so any signs of appreciation are welcome. Uh, yeah, I got a little bit philosophical here, but this is the, the sort of the end of what I, uh, what I wanted to share with you tonight. Uh, yeah, uh, GraalVM can do different things for you. Right. Uh, I hope you, I was still sharing my screen the, this whole time. Oh, that's very good. And uh, should we ask if anybody has any questions? I think we have time for this. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions for Oleg? You can, yeah. you can type or you can. What do you think yeah. about? Yeah. Don't be shy. You can <laughs> ask anything. Right. This is actually while you're thinking about the questions, I can I can share one uh, one data point about asking questions. You know how there are different cultures, how people learn and how people communicate in different settings. So Estonia is very close to Russia, right? So I'm I'm on the on the like border between two cultures, and in the European culture asking questions is not very often something that people do eagerly, right? And I think the sentiment there is that, oh, I didn't understand something, thus I'm stupid, right? And everyone else are smart and they understood everything. So I will just distract everyone by asking my question, right? And that, and people don't ask questions or don't like asking questions that much. In the Russian tradition and the culture, it's absolutely the opposite. When you ask question, that means that you understood that you didn't understand something. And thus, you are smarter than everyone else who didn't understand that they didn't understand because they didn't get the question, right? So uh, questions are absolutely excellent. Right, and we have a question from Salva. Is there a more information regarding optimizations done in Oracle Realm uh, And the question is, uh, yeah, absolutely. There is more information about that. If you are asking particularly about the Oracle Gravium Enterprise Edition, which is a proprietary product, uh, then yes, there are some patented optimizations in there, uh, and there is there there are some there are of course information about uh, what those particular things do. Uh, I'm not sure how the best you can you can learn that information, but I, if you're asking about the product, I, I would be absolutely happy to connect you with our product managers. Uh, or if you want to go as far as that, I can connect you with the salespeople as well. Uh, if you're asking about GraalVM compiler in general, right, and optimizations, how the compiler works, then there is information as well. Uh, and I also have a session that I do can do potentially maybe some other time or maybe I can find some other conference venue uh, about the compiler and what makes the compiler so good, right? So in a nutshell, if I just summarize that in like two minutes, uh, GraalVM compiler is uh, the optimization works on the, on the graph 
similar to what C2 does, right? But it's a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, maybe because because if what it was it's just newer, right? So the second implementation is typically smarter and better just because you have the experience of the first one. Uh, but also there is quite a bit of work, academic work done into that. And then GraalVM compiler has excellent high level optimizations. So our inlining, our polymorphic inlining, our uh, escape analysis and data flow analysis are absolutely top notch. So even if the smaller, lower level optimizations are not that fine tuned, GraalVM GraalVM gets better performance just because the high level, bigger optimizations that uh, that are, are, are really, really good, right? So this is the, the very, and I can, I can also send a link, for example, I, I'll find a link later and somehow uh, share the information, uh, some blog posts about the particular optimizations and some code examples and snippets about the compiler, right? So if you read the assembly, that, that would be an interesting read for you. If you don't read the assembly, like I, like I don't read the assembly, I just stare at it, <laughs> then it will still be an interesting read, but maybe a little bit less uh, uh, detailed, right? Uh, right. We have another question from Andre. Is migration from OpenGPT to Graal supposed to be a drop-in replacement or there will be additional steps needed? Uh, Yes, it's supposed to be a drop-in replacement. So GraalVM binary, the GraalVM distribution, right? Contains a, a compatible JDK, which means that you put the Java on the path and you run the Java and it runs, uh, and it runs the same Java applications uh, that your other JDKs can run, right? That's the whole point of the standardization uh, and compatibility. Uh, there could be there are like one particular component, subcomponent of the VM that needs to be aware of the JIT, and that is the garbage collection, right? So, a garbage collection needs to like it, the other way around. The JIT needs to be aware of the garbage collection, because the garbage collection can, when it runs, it can impose certain uh, certain scheme of how the objects get accessed. So sometimes you need to read barriers or write barriers. Sometimes your objects are migrated. So you need to pad them with some, like for example, forwarding pointer or something, right? So the garbage collection can change how your objects are accessed. So it can change what can be done within the code. So the JIT needs to know about GC because when it, it, it compiles the code, like it better worked the same way <laughs> with the GC as, as, as previously. Right, so it, there is no point in compiling code while while breaking it at the same time. So those two need to work in tandem. That means that to, for integration with additional GCs, you need the integration in the GraalVM compiler as well. So currently we support the the parallel GC, G1 GC, uh, and I think I've heard something about CMS. Uh, so those could run uh, if you use some newer GCs then you will not be able to use either the GraalVM compiler or that particular GC implementation. So in that sense, the application will still run, but uh, that is something to be aware of. Uh, right. Uh, so I hope that answers, right? How about migrating existing applications on Oracle JK to GraalVM? This is, uh, literally the same thing. So Oracle JDK is the, the distribution of open JDK, right? Uh, so not, not on eight, right? But like on, on 11, when eight, there are some differences between open JDK and Oracle JDK. But uh, in that sense, if you use an Oracle JDK, then you, I, I would encourage you to look at the Oracle GraalVM Enterprise Edition, which builds on top of Oracle JDK, right? Uh, and then the migration will be absolutely trivial uh, the same way you just re change the paths and you're good to go. Uh, and also, uh, Puneet D1 asking, is asking, have we been able to run Spring Boot apps in GraalVM? So I hope I try to make it absolutely clear that GraalVM can give you different choices how to run the application, right? Uh, 
all applications run in digit mode, right? They're just normal JVM process. Everything will run. You can run Spring Boot like that in GraalVM. If you're talking specifically about building the native image out of that, uh, I would encourage you to look at the project called Spring Native. Uh, and there is, it's a, it's a very interesting project. What it does, what it does, it gives you the configuration necessary for running, for running, uh, for running Spring applications as the GraalVM native images, right? So it's available on GitHub. You can find some blog posts. Uh, you can some 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 sessions by the Spring team. Uh, committers and contributors about how to run Spring applications as native images. There are a lot of samples that work out of the box. A lot of technologies are supported. The broader Spring ecosystem might see some challenges. Yeah, the main part there is you need to understand what GraalVM native image is doing, and then you can run mostly all applications. But it requires you to understand what native image is doing, what your JDK is doing, what your application is doing, what your dependencies are doing. All the code that gets into the final result, you need to sort of understand what it is doing. Which some could argue that this actually like maybe a good thing to understand what your application is doing. <laughs> but very often we we are just uh, kind of drowning in complexity and rely on on just proven battle tested solutions that, oh, this works. And even if I don't understand how it works, it sort of works somehow, right? So then there could be some obstacles because some parts you need to, maybe dynamic parts you need to configure and, and so on, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, certainly look at those presentations, look at that, uh, uh, look at that project uh, for Spring applications and ground yeah. I hope that's it because it took a little bit, a few minutes longer than uh, I expected. So uh, I'm sorry for that, but I hope it was interesting. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was very interesting. Uh, yeah, thanks for your time and thanks for your talk. Uh, I think now we can move to Adrian, if you are ready, Adrian. Yeah, uh, thank you, Oleg. Uh, if you can unshare your screen. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, just uh, for like a few seconds during Adrian's setup, um, just a small um, sketching that you will receive everyone about your lecture. Oh my God, this is absolutely brilliant. Oh, this is spectacular. So- Oh, thank you, you so much. You will receive it, so and all the participants too. So now we will go to Adrian. So please, Michael. Yeah, actually, I already presented Adrian, who is the CTO of Zinica Singapore, and who will be talking about okay, since GraalVM is bringing more performance, smaller footprint, does it mean that we can actually? consume less resources and maybe protect the environment. So that's the perspective we're going to take with Adrian's talk. All right. So to you, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. And thanks, uh, Oleg. Uh, it was uh, very interesting. And actually, uh, it's going to support what uh, I will be presenting. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Adrian. So I'm not sure if you can see my face over there. <laughs> but anyway, um, the idea uh, behind uh, well, VM, uh, as you've seen, it's an engineering tool. So Oleg has presented you a lot of different features and very exciting, uh, you know, promises about the product itself. And I wanted to uh, approach it uh, slightly differently and give you maybe uh, an architect's insight on how maybe this uh, technology has potential to be used in a better way. Um, so let's start and let's explore a bit. And first, let's start with uh, the name itself, Graal. So we're going to explore if we have really found the Graal, meaning uh, did we finally found the silver bullet for all our issues? Um, we're going to explore that a bit. And for that, just give me a moment. 
So if we start with GraalVM, it's a set of features. We've seen that with Oleg. Um, it's polyglot, it's efficient. So you got the GIT um, compiler, you got uh, the AOT compiler. It's extendable. Um, what uh, we have not really uh, deep dived in is uh, we can add a lot of different extensions, plugins and all. And if you look at the native image feature, the one that you've seen uh, marketed everywhere, it's actually a plugin. So the fact that we have uh, a new developer's kit that is so extendable with uh, a lot of different well thought features is actually pretty exciting for, for the future. So maybe we've found something that can last as well, a technology that uh, you know can make a big impact when it's ready, so as of now, and then maybe we can also use in the future. All right, so let's pro explore a bit further now uh, because uh, this talk is also about um, green IT, right, and sustainability. So when we talk about sustainability, we usually talk about the three Ps. And usually when uh, you work on projects, when you work on technology, uh, you worry about two. You worry about people, so the, the persons that you serve and the person that develop the solutions. And you also worry about making profit, right? That, that's usually what we do in the industry. When you find a balance between these two, you can find fair solutions. But that's not enough for sustainability. Um, when we want sustainability, we usually we will aim for the three Ps. And the third one is actually the planet. So that's why you get a lot of talks about uh, environment, about ecology in general, to be including in the solutions that we design as architects, as engineers, for IT products. When you add the planet, uh, um, well, vector, uh, usually when you combine it with uh, you know, people-oriented solutions, and uh, that also range uh, in the in the build mode, the pace of the developers. You talk about livable approaches, right? Uh, it's good for the planet, it's good for the people, but you don't make a living out of it. When you combine the planet and the profit, uh, you have viable options. It's not really directed towards people. Well, you might think of some social, uh, you know, applications as well, social media applications uh, about that. They're making profit. Um, it can be sustainable in a way for the planet, but it's not really directed to the people. It can be a bit too intrusive, for example, I can use them where in, instead of serving them. But when you have all three, that's actually when you can find a sustainable product. When you have a good balance between making money, having the necessary resources and the, never burn them, and when you address people's needs, when you include them in the process of the, in the build process and in the usage, that's where you can find a sustainable approach. So now the idea is, uh, is there a relationship between these two? Okay, we, we're going to explore that. We're going to check, because that's a question that we have. We don't have an answer yet. We're going to check if GraalVM is actually aligned and can be a good tool to build sustainable products. Before we do that, um, what I propose is and bear with me a moment on that, sorry, is that we have a, a quick focus, right? A quick focus on, uh, on what it means uh, for the planet. What is the impact? Uh, why, why do we try to, be, to build sustainable products also for the planet? Uh, I, I will give you just some numbers. Bear with me for like five minutes uh, in order to deep dive in that. All right, so we're gonna talk about three, three things. It's gonna be quite fast. Greenhouse gases, the emissions of CO2 and other gases like methane. We're going to talk about recycling, recycling in information technologies and technology in general. And the last one, we're going to talk about obsolescence. Right? So let's start with greenhouse gases. Just a few num just a, some numbers for you to know what we're talking about. There has been a real study back then in 2013. Uh, it was um, you know, uh, conducted by CET and Bell. And what they found out uh, by uh, examining all the servers that were running, um, you know, supporting the internet and all, found out that the greenhouse gases emission from their servers alone was actually 2% of the global CO2 emission. And back then, they only looked at CO2. And back then, they had many servers as well. And also back then, it was already the equivalent of the aviation industry. Now we are in 2020. 
we have new studies as well, uh, conducted also by Bell, but you have to see that in 2020, we have 70 million servers against 34 billion devices, your mobile devices, your tablets, all these devices, you, you must have multiple screens at home as well. And you, maybe you have a 4K television as well. Smart TVs, right? 34 billion devices. The impact of this is huge. Today, we think that uh, actually we're more towards 3% of the global emission. And if we include methane and all the greenhouse gases, not just CO2, it's actually even higher. When we look at that, um, the part of the emission from the service is only 35% nowadays. When we look at 2013, uh, already when we talked just about service, it was already 2% of the global emission. Today, uh, the global emission of greenhouse gases that is from the service is only 35% of the total. The devices, they take 62%, and 35% of these 62% comes from manufacturing new devices. So we already see that uh, we may have an issue by renewing our devices um, very frequently. So one of the main basic of eco design, when you are designing applications that are sustainable, is actually also to include as much as possible the legacy devices. If you need a new device, uh, the latest train, you know, in order to run your applications, your products, then you are not really helping in that way. That's something that we have to be aware about, aware of. So it's fine, it's a choice. We may have a good, um, a good explanation, a good excuse as well for that, but I'm just trying to, uh, to raise awareness on that aspect. So let's move on to recycling now, uh, some numbers in order to, to know what we're talking about as well. Today only 20% of the e-waste, so basically uh, your devices, when you throw them in the trash bin, only 20% of the components are re recycled. 80% of them, you know, they're, they're either burnt or they're, they're just left in an island or somewhere. But out of this 20%, what is even worse is that we found out with some studies and uh, with uh, deep investigation that 70% of these 20% of the e-waste that are supposed to be recycled because they enter the recycling process, 70% are trafficked, meaning that 70% of the people and the organizations handling the recycling of your IT products and your IT devices, they are from the mafia. They are from illegal organizations. So by doing that, you are actually making the mafia organization sustainable. You are, you are working towards sustainability in a way, but maybe not the ones that you were looking at, right? So that's, that's kind of a crisis uh, these days. It's pretty difficult uh, to actually know what they're going to do when um, you, you give them your devices in order to be recycled. Sometimes they're just gonna dump it, if you're lucky, or sometimes they're gonna make money out of it. So they are going to go even more powerful. Now let's look at obsolescence. When you build an IT product, it's not for free. Um, of course, uh, you have to pay money, but you have to pay more than that. You have to pay for the time of the people. And even beyond that, when you run your uh, applications and when you build them, you will need these devices, these hardwares anyway, either the developer's laptops or the newest ones, right? Every developer wants a, a new laptop in a way. You also need uh, the little servers. You need uh, a lot of different machines and all, and sometimes not really optimized. In that aspect, uh, you need a lot of different minerals to build these devices, and we have a limited resource on Earth. Second, it takes a lot of water. You need a lot of water in order to, to manufacture these, um, these hardware, and you need also a lot of energy. Right? When we look at all this, what we would like to optimize are different things. We would like to optimize runtime, so making it uh, more efficient, spend less time on compilation, spend less time also on waiting for the application to start, optimize the CPU, the GPU utilization. We've seen that also with Graal a bit. We're gonna go back uh, to Graal in a minute, don't worry. We also want to look at uh, the device compatibility because you've seen how much waste we generate, right? By changing our devices. So we want to make the devices last longer. 
based on all of this, we also want to recycle other things. And I haven't talked about it, but we want to recycle skills. That's why I talk about languages. Today, we have a big community uh, with Java. And you've seen maybe uh, with the latest trends that Java sometimes, uh, well, is still pretty uh, steady in terms of popularity. But developers are interested in the new things, right? In Python, in Scala, in a lot of different languages. And it's normal because we like change as well. In that aspect, though, um, we are not recycling competency as efficiently as we, maybe we should in order to have sustainable ways of developing products. And let's look at how maybe Gradient can answer that. All right, I'm finished with that particular, you know, uh, fatalistic uh, part. Hopefully we can be a bit more optimistic now. Oh, one more thing. Um, how do you assess all these things and the impact of uh, your um, technology productions? Usually we use uh, LCAs for life cycle assessments. Of course, the LCS, since uh, we are going to talk about certain attributes and uh, certain properties of our build process and our run time process, they are only so good for comparisons. When you use the same um, elements of comparisons, then it's good you can compare if when you have built a product and when you run it, it's actually better or not uh, compared to another product with the same assessment. You cannot use an LCA to compare very different uh, products, apple and oranges. You can't do that, right? So once you ask, when you once you stick with some uh, elements of comparison, you should reuse them with the same kind of products and see if you can improve your processes. That's how usually uh, you tend to, um, you know, optimize your usage of uh, abiotic resources and also, uh, you know, have not so much waste. All right, let's go back there. So we're going to have a quick focus on uh, eco design, right? Uh, beyond um, engineering, 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 um, is the etymology of it is actually um, um, more towards inception. People are inventing stuff, right? Uh, it's all about uh, creation, uh, engineering. When we talk about architecture and design, architecture it's great. It's from the Greek word um, that means a lead builder. And in that aspect, we are supposed to look much further than the engineers, right, as architects. Our engineers can be architects as well. It's just a role that depends on the time. But when you have an architecture po an architect posture, usually we, you will try to work on the design itself. And if your product can last, is scalable, and goes with an ROI. And when you, we talk about ROI, it's the return of investment usually. But then, I will propose you another definition. If we can reuse, if we can optimize, and if we can innovate, All right? These are the three things that uh, I would propose. And let's look at GraalVM from this angle. Let's look at GraalVM and see if we can reuse stuff, if it's going to help us on optimization, and if it will help us on innovation as well. All right, let's start with reusing. The Java community, right? GraalVM, of course it's polyglot, of course now it's inclusive, it's much more inclusive. You can run a bunch of different new languages uh, because of Truffle and because of uh, LLVM as well. It's, it's pretty exciting. Um, but the core of it is actually the JVM, right? And the JVM itself and how to integrate and how to use Java, the, um, the first citizen language and the historical one, you have a uh, whole community around it. You can reuse the skill set of many people, of the whole community. You have 20 plus years of experience. It's a mature technology. It's a mature community. It's very helpful. You've got a lot of developers. You can reuse all this and you can already share. You got practices around it. You're not left alone. We have solved so many problems in Java that today, uh, when you have a new issue, you go to Stack Overflow, I'm pretty sure someone has already tackled it. So about reusing in eco design, uh, you don't spend too much time finding out how to solve a problem. So you're optimizing your development with that. So it's good reuse. Also, you are reusing all the 20 years of experience on how to build very performance virtual machines. That's why today when Oleg says, instead of the art, JVM, 
plugin with the offer with the JT compiler is right. It's born out of all the experiences and all the also expert advice of the people. And that's the final product that you have today. When we move on to optimization, we talk about things like memory footprint, and you've seen that now we have the opportunity to reduce it. We talk about throughput as well, and now we are given options as well. We can either go with native images, or we can just use the JIT because we need computing power. Even more than that, we need to have a hand on that. If we want to delegate it to a third-party system with native images to run serverless applications in the cloud, for example, in order for the cloud to scale our own applications, we can do that. But if we want to handle the throughput internally, we have garbage collector optimizations on our side. We, uh, we have many things that we can optimize out of today. So it's very good for the throughput as well. For the package size, now we have an opportunity to also control it. With native images, we've seen that, we've seen the differences of the sizes, and also with the modular VM, right? That's something that we would like uh, in the generalized ecosystem. For innovation now, because that's, you, you can't just have a uh, reusal and optimization. If you stick to that, you're going to be very conservative. And the problem with being conservative is that you don't survive much because times are changing. So in order to build sustainable products, in order to build a sustainable development environment, you also need a base for innovation. So let's look at that as well. What I like about um, innovation and uh, tools for innovation is the, the capability of flexibility. When we tackle um, a, new, a new problem and when we want to find a solution, we are going to ask ourselves a lot of questions, right? And when we are going to engineer a product, usually we start with these questions. We want to know whether we have to spread um, the technologies, we have to uh, look at different uh, you know, technology as, uh, in order to solve different issues, or we want to centralize everything. For example, uh, if you use Kafka, maybe uh, some of you already use it, you want to understand whether you want to use Kafka as a backbone for your product, or do you want to use Kafka as a modular component just for messaging, right? Do you want to spread or do you want to centralize? Then the second thing is, uh, do you want to have more possibilities or do you want to have better options? When you start with a product, you have to see if what you are interested in are the options that the product proposes you or if they propose you to do things in a better way. Sometimes you can have both. Sometimes you can have neither, right? So that's something you have to look at. Then there's another part is uh, about tailored versus templated. Do you want your tool to be um, very flexible and you can do whatever you want with that? Or do you want to, it to be very opinionated and give you the templates to be faster? So all of these are the triggers for innovations because um, you will have many different paths and you will be able to grow differently. And that's how you innovate. It's by finding new paths. It's by figuring out that there is no silver bullet. So maybe there is no Graal in the end, but maybe Graal VM helps you innovate. There is this thing called uh, GraalVM as a platform. And um, well, Oleg hasn't really pushed uh, further about this thing, but you've seen that uh, with uh, Truffle, for example, you can create your own languages that can run on the VM. With uh, LLVM, you can uh, build a tons of languages that are also built on LLVM and you can just run them on, uh, on GraalVM as well. So you can use GraalVM as a development platform for R&D for new ways of writing applications which is pretty exciting. But with GraalVM uh, overall, sorry, you have choices. Uh, you have choices like AOT versus GIT. You have choices like JVM versus LLVM or Swing um, or Truffle. Java or Truffle uh, based languages, um, even all the first class citizens are like the JavaScript and all, and you have extendability. GraalVM is a platform. It's not just, you know, the native image compilation and the optimization and the fancy stuff about, uh, oh, it's freakingly fast. It's much more than that. It gives you a lot of options as inputs, meaning that you can decide um, your 
languages, you can decide how you want to develop your products, and you can now also decide how you want to run them. So it gives you plenty of options during the build phase and other options during the runtime phase, which is pretty great for a product, right? We don't have that much uh, with uh, the other developers' environment. Well, some of them try to. I will. I will. Uh, I will. Uh, just wanted to, like, you know, uh, it's not like uh, any data query I want to fire. It's, it's more like. Uh, All right. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> So now let's move on a bit. Uh, we've seen uh, stuff about uh, the three P's, about sustainable products, uh, what we will need to design them from an architecture standpoint. We've seen why it can be important for the planet uh, to worry about uh, ecology in general, to build sustainable products because we have limited resources and also it impacts the planet, what we are building in technology. And we've talked a bit about eco-design and how RALVM could relate to that. And now we are going to move to the last part. The last part is how agility can help sustainability. And I'm still going to talk about GraalVM, right? But from a certain standpoint, from the agile standpoint. Let's talk about agility first. Usually when we develop products, we have that, right? Uh, we have a scope, we have some time, we need to develop something and we have an initial target, and we are going to evaluate the time it takes us to go there. So that's how we define speed, the first evaluation of the velocity of your development. The base, the core of Agile, um, it's all about change management, right? It's all about course correction. So instead of focusing on your target, instead of focusing on your initial speed, what you are going to focus on is how fast, how reactive you can be when you change the target. How fast can you know, change the course. That's agility. If you, you don't need to know, know by heart the manifesto, you don't need to go even further. If you have understood this, you have understood the principle of agile. Now, how can it help? And how can uh, Gradium, you know, help in that? It can help in sustainability because you will always adjust. That's the first thing. Once, once you measure and you will have some feedback on uh, your application, consuming that much resource, running on this kind of device, not visible once. When you have all this feedback, and when you work on it, when you readjust the target, agi agility is going to help you. Now, well, the end, it provides a good platform in order to have agile development because it's flexible. Uh, since you can delay some choices on conception and engineering with GraalVM, it helps you redirecting, right? Redirecting the choices, uh, doing some course correction after the initial inception phase. So GraalVM gives you flexibility on packaging. You can do native packaging, you can use the J2, you can use different uh, ways to package and it's extendable so maybe tomorrow you'll have all the plugins coming in that you could install in your JDK and use afterwards. It can provide you options for deployment. Now with it, uh, for a long time we wanted to uh, use uh, Java technologies for serverless. We can use it already in the cloud Java, right? We can use it on a computing machine. You know? It's fairly good, but we need to get the VM ops and uh, we have to worry about them. We have to worry about load balancing ourselves and all and going for full serverless architecture, just write our functions uh, in Java was not really helpful. It was proposed, but the time to start a function could take one to two seconds because of the old VMs. Now we are beyond that, so we have multiple options for deployment, which is pretty, pretty interesting for architects. And also, for usages, we can look at this further. Oleg has not really lingered on that. But if you heard what he said at the beginning of his talk, and maybe you caught it, you can run GraalVM directly embedded in databases. You can run GraalVM as native applications on your phones, on your mobile, if you're in a Linux environment. You can run this everywhere, basically. So you can really fine tune it to have multiple deployment options that you didn't have back then because not every device could run a JVM. 
the fact that now the JVM is optimized is pretty great when we need a uh, CPU and memory intensive uh, kind of work, a lot of computing um, a throughput, right? But with this native image, we have the possibility to look at beyond the usages that we have today with Java. And we can do that without thinking about it at the beginning of uh, our development. So what's next? And is Bradley Ham helpful? I would say yes. I think Bradley Ham helps a lot for sustainability, for building sustainable product because it gives you all these changes, all this flexibility. And it's very promising because as you've seen, um, it's uh, you know um, still in the creation phase. You have Oracle Labs, you have the community very interested in the project. You have uh, different uh, ways of using it with Micronaut, uh, with Focus as well. And you have all these efforts in order to build many more tools around it. And I'm pretty sure it's still not mature yet, but in the, in the future, it will help you. And it's a good foundation, it's a good platform in order to adopt agile developments, so a technical agility, and to build sustainable products. Because when you are going to build it, you are going to reuse. You are going to uh, reuse the talents, the skills of the people. You are going to create new ways of deploying these to devices in order to help people that may not have the latest products, that cannot run the latest JVM and all, that do not have that much power in their hand. You are going to have many more options. And I think that's a good preparation for change for the future, right? So yeah, that's about it. Uh, I do believe that WellVM can be a good match and can give us hope, right? Can uh, make us optimistic about being a good tool for the future. Thank you. And do you have any questions? Just looking at the questions now. Adrian, I think there was a few questions about what tool you're looking using for your presentations because it looks pretty awesome. <laughs> oh, that's concept. Yeah. Okay. I think it was uh, written already. And yes, it's on iPad. All right. And that's about it. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Adrian. It was very interesting. Thanks for connecting the dots on environment and Gravy VM. Uh, Jerome, do we have anything else before closing? I think we cannot hear you. Let me unmute myself. Yes. I was trying to finish uh, the recording from Adrian. <laughs> Unfortunately, not enough quick. So um, as I currently have a technical issue for the music and everything, we will leave you in silence. And if you have any question now to both Oleg and Adrian, feel free to type it. If you find this, this uh, meetup completely boring, feel free to type it also in the chat. Or if you liked it, feel free to type it in the chat too. Feel free to interact with us. And um, I will try to provide more uh, recording um, to, to all the talk we will have uh, furthermore. Uh, and yes, I am using also concept. Adrian, did you make your own drawings or did Jerome do it for you? No, he is the artist. Okay. So speak out, Adrian. Uh, um, so Jerome gave me the, the tool, as you can imagine, because we work together a lot. Uh, but I myself uh, did all the drawings. That's cool. It's one of the concepts of agility. Just provide tool. People will find a way to use it. Yeah. And there is a need for change too with uh, presentation. That's why. So, ah, um, thank you, Punit. You're a lovely person. 
I love you. <laughs> love you too, bro. <laughs> Happy New Year to all of you. Yeah. Happy New Year. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks, Adrian and Oleg. Oleg, I understand you have a big milestone today, right? About GraalVM? Or... Yeah, uh, apparently the, today is the release date for GraalVM 21.0, the first release of this year. That's cool. You guys have any kind of release yeah, on here? No, no, mostly the, oh, the, like, to be honest, yes, right? So it's a little bit awkward time zone for people in Singapore. Uh, but I, I invite you all to a live stream of what I call the unboxing stream for Gralium 21.0, which will be like evening European time. So it's sort of weird for uh, people uh, more into Asia. Uh, it will be 7 p.m. Central European time. Uh, it will be live stream on Twitch, twitch.com slash oracle underscore labs. Uh, you can find, you can find, like if you Google my Twitter account, you can find the links. I think that's the easiest. Uh, yeah, and we're gonna, we're gonna unbox that uh, GraalVM and look at the changes and uh, maybe see some demos and there will be some guests. And this is the new thing that I would try to incorporate into our community this year, right? And this is the first one. So I'm a little bit nervous about how it will go, but I assume it will be very casual. So uh, hopefully it will be fun. And as in every, every time the release is very uh, interesting time because like there are so many components, right? And they all move forward at their own pace. Uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit stressful because we, we only have sort of one voice as the whole team, right? And it's a little bit, uh, and of course this is my subjective opinion, right? And uh, everything, but it's very important not to forget some projects, right? So there's obviously a lot of interest and a lot of hype and a lot of eyes on the native image, for example, right? and somewhat on the compiler because the compiler powers everything. Uh, but even the projects that are maybe not as uh, popularized, they're very important, right? So for example, we have the Graal Vasm, the WebAssembly interpreter support, right? And uh, it doesn't, like we, we, we don't talk about it enough or like a, lo a lot, right? But it's it's important not to forget about those the existence of those or the tooling, for example, right? This is what Adrian talked about as well, right? So that there is there is the the ecosystem of uh, of uh, surrounding like adjacent projects near the actual like runtime project, right? So and the tooling is a very important part of GraalVM. This is tooling is actually what I think tooling is what makes it an ecosystem truly right so the languages get support for developing tooling there's uh there are things around that uh which is uh always always they they surprise personally they surprise me the most right? because they come up with new cool things to <laughs> to do every release even though like it seems like what what new can be there in in the tooling section right but uh, but yeah, there are projects, there are like experimentation and you know, what you uh, very correctly emphasized, I think, Adrian, is Gralium is not just the runtime that you can use right now. Of course you can, right? You can, and it might provide benefits. It might provide like more benefits or it might be like uh, interesting for you as a, like a, as a product, as a business to use it or not, like that's all about the trade-offs, but it also provides the test bed for the future projects and exploration, which uh, very often is is interesting. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah, best of luck for, um, for this today. I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you guys. I, I think we can probably like close the channel now. So, uh,
And thanks, Jerome. It's very interesting to see your drawing live. Thank you. <laughs> I'm still practicing. Oh, this sure. is brilliant. I would, I would love to be able to do something like this. And I know that it's mostly practice. And yes. <laughs> but uh, I would like to be uh, able to read the GVM completely and understand <laughs> all the old parameters. And how do you manage your survival garbage collection and then an old and stuff like this to optimize responsive and non-responsive application? And it's still right. more practice. Yeah, I can connect you to some people who know. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's my past. I, I leave it behind me. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So have a good night or a good day. And uh, yeah, see you next time. See you Thank next you time. Much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.